I'm going to show you how you can add Jupyter to your app. It takes as little as 15 minutes and you can even do it if you're using a site builder like Wix or WordPress. Or if you want to build a custom white label solution with the API, I'm going to walk you through that too, step by step. The easiest way to add Jupyter swaps to your app is with the terminal. This gives you end-to-end -end swaps and all you have to do is link it into your HTML, which is just one or two lines added to your website. You can have it as a modal so it'll pop up when you click it or you can have it integrated wherever you want or my preference is you can have it as a widget so it'll pop up when you click it. It's pretty customizable so you can specify which assets you want your users to swap and you can even fix the mints so they're not able to change the selections. All you have to do to add it to your app is add in this bit of code. It works either with HTML or if you're using uh, a React app, you can even do that. Let me show you what this looks like. Right here, I've got a plain HTML file. To add Jupyter swaps to this, I'm gonna need to do three things. First, I need a script tag that loads in all of the Jupyter terminal code, and I've got that right here. I've added in the defer and data preload attributes to make sure that this script is loaded in its entirety before the rest of the file is run. Next, we need a div with the ID Jupyter terminal and I've got that right over here. Once we have these two in place, we can initialize the Jupyter terminal with window.jupyter.init. To be extra sure, I have added in a uh, event listener for DOM content loaded. So I wanna make sure the rest of this is loaded before this thing runs. Um, finally, one thing I will recommend that you do is you change the endpoint. So if you look at the documentation for the Jupyter terminal, right here, they've got um, api.mainnetbeta.solana.com. This is the free and publicly available uh, endpoint and the rate limits on this are pretty bad. So you don't wanna be using that. You wanna use your own endpoint. You can use whatever RPC service you want. You can use Triton, Helios, whatever it is. The free ones will work all right unless you have hundreds of users in which scenario you should probably get a paid version. All right, let's take a look at what this looks like. Uh, this is it right here. I've got uh, the setup going. I have added in a bit of styling over here. I've just centered it and uh, set the uh, background to black. If I click connect wallet and select phantom, you can see my wallet, which is test on prod is showing up and I can click connect and it should show you my balances. There we go. One final thing I will recommend or just let you know is that sometimes with uh, website builders, they don't let you fully control which code or which sections run first. So you might need to do something like this. This is a bit of a trick I have in case uh, you get any errors. Um, so what this will do is this will create a div it will give it the, uh, the ID Jupyter terminal and it will add it to the body. So it will be absolutely certain that the, you'll be absolutely certain that the div necessary exists. Um, if you, if for whatever reason something isn't working, you can open up the console and should it should give you uh, an, an idea of what's going wrong. As you can see, because I am on the free RPCs, uh, I'm getting a few rate limits, but that's okay because this will work anyway. Moving on, if you wanna add the Jupyter Terminal to a React app instead of an HTML page, the process for that is quite similar. I've got the code for that in the description. Right now, I wanna talk about the two other ways of adding Jupyter to your app, the second of which is the Jupyter JavaScript API client. This is really handy if you're a JavaScript developer. It lets you install, initialize, and add to components without needing a wallet. So if you wanna get codes for different asset swaps without actually having a wallet available, you can do that. I am not gonna show you how to use this. Instead, we're gonna go with the actual raw API calls themselves. I'm gonna explain how the API works and then we'll build out a custom swap solution on our own. There's three parts to every single Jupyter swap. First, you need to get a code for the assets that you're swapping. Next, you need to build a transaction for the user that's actually swapping the assets. Finally, you need to sign and send off that transaction to complete the swap. Let's take a look at what each of these looks like, starting with the code. To get a code, you're gonna tell Jupyter what you're swapping and how much. You can also specify slippage to make sure you get exactly how much you want. Jupyter is gonna tell you what rates you'll get, so how much the expected output will be, and the fees and even the route. Uh, from there, you can build the swap transaction. That means you're gonna give Jupyter the code and you're gonna give it the user's public keys, the user that's actually doing the transaction or th that's doing the swap, you're gonna give that to Jupyter. You can also specify transaction settings such as various fees, uh, how much compute you want to use or uh, various uh, AMMs or automated market makers that you wanna avoid. In return, Jupyter will give you a transaction that you can sign. From here, you, since you've got the transaction, you're gonna sign the transaction, you're gonna make a plan for sending the transaction and you're gonna send it off to the Solana network and that is it, your swap is complete. 
This is what the endpoints actually look like. This is what they expect in, and this is what they're going to give you in return. Input mint and output mint, these are the addresses of the tokens that you want to swap. So input mint, for instance, might be the Solana token. So you would have over here the address of the Solana token. That would be Sol11111. And output mint would be the mint address of USDC, for instance. Amount is exactly that amount. Slippage, this is in basis points. So it's slippage BPS. And this in turn will give you a code response. This code response you can feed into the swap endpoint along with the user's public key. So this is a Solana address as well as a few configuration or options uh, such as wrap and unwrap sold. This is a Boolean option. And this will give you a serialized transaction that you can sign. All right, enough talking. Let's actually build this out. This is a React VDAP. It's got a bunch of Solana stuff added in, such as providers for the network, the wallets, as well as some hooks to send transactions and retrieve balances. I've got it set up to swap SOL tokens to USDC tokens. And just for the sake of understanding, to make it really easy, I've separated the UI from the swap components. So let's take a look at what the swap actually looks like and while I walk you through the UI. I've kept the UI pretty simple here. All the user can do is select their wallet, put in the amount of SOL they wanna swap, and they'll get a code for the USDC they'll get based on current prices. If they're okay with this, they can click swap, click swap and a transaction pop-up will show up and they can go ahead and complete their swap. Let's take a look at what the UI looks like. Starting off, I have, you can see that I've hard coded the assets. So these are the token mints for Sol, the SOL token and the USDC token. Normally you would get this from the Jupyter token master list. This is going to be deprecated soon. So you'll have to refer to whatever the current solution is based on when you're watching this video but that's where you'd normally get this. For now, I'm just hard coding this so we can focus on the logic of the swap itself. Next up, we've got use wallet and use cluster. These will give us access to the connected wallet and the connected network. And I'm also doing a balance fetch using one of the hooks that is available for me. Uh, next up, we have the actual components for the swap itself. I'm gonna be going through all of this in a bit, so we can just collapse this for now. The way I have my code set up, it lets you swap any two tokens, but because I'm hard coding these two specific tokens, I'm just using a use effect, just set these for this specific instance. The UI itself is pretty straightforward. I've got some labels, uh, some, some text over here, a wallet button that's available from the Solana provider, um, displaying the cluster, uh, the balance, and uh, then you've got the actual swap container itself. I'm not gonna go through this because it's pretty self-explanatory. Now let's take a look at the actual swap logic. The first thing we have for the uswap hook is the argument that's passed in, which is the token metadata map. To be able to do a swap, we need two things. For each token, we need the token in the token mint and the number of decimals. So for me, in my instance, I'm just using a token metadata map. You can just pass in the mint uh, mint uh, value and the decimal value. I'm just I'm using a map. You don't have to use a map. You can do whatever you want. Moving on, we've got a bunch of stateful items. So this is all the things, all the things we need to keep track of when we're actually doing the swap, uh, what the input token is, what the output token is, how much input, what's the estimated output, what's the code response, what's the slippage, uh, basis points, all of this we need to keep track. Um, and I've got all that happening over here. The next thing I have over here is a debounce call. So a debounce delays a function call by a set amount. We need this because we don't want to be spamming the code endpoint every time someone presses a button. So if let's say you want to swap 1,101 tokens, we don't want to send a code request every time you press one. We only want to send a code request once you have finished pressing all the buttons. So you do one, 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 and then a code request is sent. This way we're not spamming the code endpoint and we're not going to get rate limited. So that's what debounce is for. It just delays by a set amount. It delays a function call by a set amount. In our instance, it's 500 milliseconds. Uh, the use effect over here is just to actually put that into effect or we're just actually making that uh, happen here. And finally, we've got the actual logic for the code. So remember, the things we need for the code are how much we're swapping, the input uh, mint and the output mint. So that's over here, input mint, output mint, and the number. Well, the logic for this itself is pretty straightforward. Once we've figured out the decimals based on the inputs, we can just make a fetch request to this specific endpoint. We're gonna give in again the input, the output, the slippage. This has already been configured, so we don't need to do anything with it. And it's uh, gonna give us a JSON response back. Uh, in the future, this may change. There may be an API a key that you need to have over here, but the overall logic will remain the same. 
Once we have the response, we're going to set the code response and we're also going to set an estimated output based on the decimals of the output token. And there we go. Our code is complete. To finish this all off, we've got the sign and send transactions. So once we have a code and once the user wants to take uh, take it ahead and actually complete the, uh, the swap, we're going to need to fetch a transaction. And what we'll do for this again is we will, we're going to hit this endpoint. Uh, we're going to pass in the code response, the public key, and optionally, if we want to wrap it on a wrap soul. If you don't know what this means, you can leave you can just leave it as uh, at true. Now, in return, we will get a swap transaction back that we can then uh, do a bunch of transaction stuff in. Before I move on to that, I want to talk about all the other optional things that we have over here. So we there, there's a bunch of different configurations that you can make over here, such as the dynamic slippage, whether or not you want to use dynamic slippage, whether or not there's a fee account. So if a fee account is someone that is charging a fee for the swap to happen. So if you're making a really custom swap, it's really fancy, it's really cool, and you want to charge users fees for using your swap, this is where you would put your account. Um, there's some other things such as dynamic compute limit, um, as well as the custom priority fee. So if you want to set a custom priority fee, you can do that over here, as well as if you want to have uh, dynamic compute limits instead of a, you know, whatever the max is, you can do that over here. Um, I recommend not touching these if you don't know what these are. Uh, generally, uh, you don't need to be messing with this. Uh, whatever the, the default settings are usually fine for you. Now let's take a look at the actual transaction stuff happening over here. All we're doing over here is we're deserializing the transaction. We're creating a version transaction from it, and then we're signing that. So over here, sign transaction, we're going to request a user to sign the actual transaction. So when this function is called, the user is going to see a pop-up in their browser. Once that's done, we can use the send and confirm version transaction function that we've got in the Solana hooks over here. We're gonna send that off and the transaction has been sent. The user hopefully knows that their swap has been completed. There we go, done. One thing I have glossed over is the process and plan of actually sending a transaction to make sure that it lands. And that's because that's probably going to change and I could go on, on and on and on about what you need to do right now. The important things are you need to set a competitive priority fee and you need to optimize the amount of compute units you're using. The, by default, this already happens with Jupyter transactions and they're built for, to be landed. So you don't need to be bringing too much. As long as you have a good connection, you're making, you're making sure you're getting a stake connection and you have a recent block hash, you will be fine. The most important thing you probably need is some, is a good retry logic. And the Jupyter team has a really good uh, template available that walks you through how to do that. I've already included that over here in the send and confirm, ver uh, send and confirm version transaction hook over here. So if you scroll down over here, right after all of the uh, transaction sending is happening. So right here, this is where the sending is happening. I've got some retry logic over here. And this is not my retry logic. This is retry logic that the Jupyter team has provided. So you can trust that this should work right now. Uh, it's got a bunch of uh, logic over here happening and it's going to make sure it sends your transaction until it actually lands. That is all I have for you today. Check out the links in the description for all of this code, as well as other resources to get you swapping. Happy swapping, cadets.